from the sunny Helsinki, we go to uh, sunny California, where uh, I think it's seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And it's my pleasure to welcome our next keynote speaker, uh, Mark Sermon. Good morning, Executive Director, Board Member, Mozilla Foundation. And Mark's main job is to build the movement side of Mozilla, rallying the citizens of the web, building alliances with like-minded organizations and leaders, and growing the open internet movement. And the title of Mark's presentation is Same Game, New Rules, Thinking Differently About Power and Data. You're very welcome to join us, Mark. Thank you. It's great to be here and great to hear the panelists uh, so far. Just one correction. I'm actually coming from sunny Toronto, although it is between seven and eight in the morning uh, and not from California. Um, but really happy to be here and, and really grateful to Citra to inviting Mozilla into the, the conversation. We share a lot of the same goals. And so let me just throw up some slides uh, here. Sorry, it's tricky to be the person who's not in the studio and who's coming by Zoom. Uh, there we go. Okay, can you see the slides there? I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume yes. And I'll just keep going. So when, when we talk about the fair data economy, and it's something that, that we think about a, a lot and use different kind of language about it, we're talking about really a, a systems level change. We're talking about uh, you know, changing something that's core to our, our economy, to modern computing. But what I wanna to argue today is we're not talking about changing the game. We're not talking about getting rid of smartphones or home assistants. We're not talking about not using data or, or AI. But what, when we talk about a fair data economy, we're talking about changing the rules of the game around data and thinking differently around how power works and who's in control and how we balance the benefits and the decision-making. So that's what I wanna get into today. And you know, for this audience, I, I don't need to, to really do the first part of this talk, but just to flip through it quickly, um, you know, we've seen the internet in the news. I mean, the internet really, when I started out working on the internet in the 90s was the domain of, of geeks and then business people. But we've seen it in the news, you know, in, that everybody is seeing wherever you are in the world, a great deal more in recent years. So certainly we've seen a lot about misinformation. Here's a, a case of where YouTube's algorithm is talking about how it drives misinformation, some research coming out of, uh, you know, reported in The Guardian. Uh, but going back, you know, it's not just recently that we've seen that misinformation story. Cambridge Analytica, 50 million Facebook pri profiles felt shocking when that news came out only in, in 2018. And then, of course, going back to 2013, the Snowden revelations, the idea that actually, you know, whether it was the, the British or the Americans, they're taking huge amounts of consumer data that's collected in our, our everyday digital lives and using it. Um, you know, in the, in the case of the NSA to spy on their own citizens. And so what is at the heart of all of these news stories and, and so many more? Of course, the answer is data. There is just tremendous amount of data, more than ever we, we've collected in, in human history uh, available just from being connected to the internet, connected to telephone systems, surrounded by cameras. Uh, and so that, that is uh, something that is different. Uh, and something that we have to contend with, but also something that we get great value from. So there's many questions there. And of course, uh, you know, as, as has been the discussion here, and I'm sure will continue to be, we're starting to contend with that uh, as a society, as many societies, and Europe has been at the forefront with things like GDPR, the current AI regulations being discussed, the, the, um, the Data Governance Act, which is, is being floated in Brussels. And so, you know, we're starting to, to deal with the fact that this is a data society. So what about that? And are we going to get to a system change? Are we going to get to new rules? So to, to ground in that, um, again, for this audience, this, this may be the basics. It's worth understanding what is the game today that we're trying to change? What are, um, and then what are the rules of that game right now? So just to go through that quickly, you know, part of the, the game is um, this ordering your pet food on Alexa, where it is all of the things we now take for granted as the conveniences that come with our computers, our email, our smartphones, our home assistants, our getting our, our kind of maps that drive us around town. 
That's what I think of as the game. And those are all things that I don't want to get rid of. And I don't think most people want to get rid of. That's not the conversation. And of course, you know, from the consumer piece, there was a little bit in the last panel about the B2B piece and that the landscape is a bit different. It tends to be big companies, primarily um, American or Chinese, although I have Spotify on here to, to indicate there is one uh, very strong speed, Swedish company in that mid-tier. I think you have more and more growing in European companies in, the, in this space, and you should, uh, and there's an advantage to be had. We will get to that later. So, you know, it, it really is these big companies that are out there driving this game by and large for most of us. And let's actually just think about the relationship between those companies and data and us. What are the rules by which they're operating? And the core of it is not just that cute little Alexa or that pet in the commercial, um, but all of these companies are, are the drivers of and the users of modern computing driven by data and AI. That's the fuel of how all of the things that we learn and enjoy uh, really work today. And the, the assumed rules um, that, that we've got in place are that all of us gather around that company uh, and feed our data into their, um, into their data pools and into their AI. And you know, there, there's one thing that often gets lost in this, and I think this is gonna be a critical thing to understand and we come back to shifting the rules, that it's not just us as individual creators of data and our data like you know, my actions or my photos going into the pool of one of these platforms. It actually is that all of that data is collated into a, a set of a patterns, a set of AI models, a, a set of ways to see the whole. And that's actually the power uh, that comes with this era of computing and, and that you know, comes with those people who hold all of the data that comes with running those services. They're able to build predictive models, they're able to build profiles of us. And all of that comes not from our individual data, but from the inferences and the patterns that they're able to draw between all of our data. And that, that's really critical in shifting the game and that we not only need to shift the game in terms of our relationship to data holders as individuals, but we are gonna need to look at how do you think about those patterns and rebalancing power in uh, who controls those patterns and can benefit from those patterns, all of the data seen collectively. So, you know, that that's how I think of the game. That's how I think of the rules today. Um, sorry, I skipped ahead quickly. And, you know, we, we may be fine with those rules if we're just thinking about our smartphone or, or ordering dog food. But questions start to come into to place when we think about what else are those companies doing? And, you know, you certainly have the, the Snowden revelations and a bigger picture question, but Amazon who makes the Alexa also makes the Ring doorbell. And a lot of the information, including potentially facial recognition information is something that they currently are, you know, will share with police without a warrant, um, you know, a, as requested. And so the questions of what might happen with this data beyond just getting something convenient really are critical. And, and you know, we need to, to have a, set of social choices as users and, and as society as a whole uh, in where this goes. And one of the questions that, that that leaves me with is, is something like GDPR, are the regulations and is regulation at all enough? Is looking at data rights uh, for individuals enough? Are regulations alone gonna get us to a shift of the rules? And to go into that question, I actually wanna go back to what I'll call yesterday's game and, and probably the, the game you know Mozilla from the most, which is really the, the, um, the last two decades of the web. And you know, if, if today's game is the Alexa or the smartphone, yesterday's game was the web browser. When most of us maybe who are here uh, in the audience, although I'm, I'm quite old, so maybe this is not true for everybody here in the audience uh, came online, the way we accessed the world really was just the web browser. There weren't smartphones, uh, there, there weren't home assistants. And we had a problem with the web uh, you know, 20 years ago that Microsoft had come to, to dominate it. Really, they had 98% of the, the browser market was locked up by Internet Explorer and the US government in a, in a 
um, regulatory enforcement and an antitrust action came after Microsoft to say, this isn't how it should be. In the same way that, that Brussels is coming after the tech companies today to say, this isn't how it should, should be. And in this case, it wasn't about data rights. It was about the, the rights of people who are making other browsers to be able to compete on the, the dominant Windows platform. And you know what's interesting is while the, the um, Department of Justice in the US came out with a decision that Microsoft should be broken up, although that never happened, they came to a settlement with Microsoft um, and that had some impact on things. What really changed the game wasn't that regulatory action or it wasn't only that regulatory action. It opened up the opportunity for others to compete with web browsers on the Windows platform. But who it was, was actually the, the Mozilla's and the Linux's of the world, the open source community that came and shifted things. And you know, for those of you who don't know, that's the Firefox mascot there at an open source conference in Brazil in 2014, but also the, the Linux Max mascot and the free software GNU mascot. And you know, the, the difference of the what happened with say Mozilla and the open source movement is you had Internet Explorer made by one company and they used tremendous resources to come from behind when Netscape had, had taken over, you know, had kind of burst onto the scenes and opened up the, the web to people. Microsoft just used its armies of programmers in Redmond and elsewhere, used its big company powers to come back and, and build a monopoly um, over the browser market and over the web and over the internet. And what happened with the, the Mozilla community and I wasn't a part of it then, uh, was it was a, a set of people who banded together. There was a small foundation with about 10 staff, but really it was thousands of volunteers who built Firefox. And so what happened there wasn't just changing the, the game. The game was still the browser. What happened was changing the rules of it isn't just a company who can make this, but we can actually use the power of open source, the power of community, the power of wanting to do something different to change how the game works to change the rules. Uh, and that's something that you know, I'm really proud to be a part of uh, and, and wanna see us do again into the future. And I think most importantly, it's something, and this is what attracted me to Mozilla, um, it, it's something that really created that kind of system change. So if you just look at what happened in that period uh, of the, the early web, you, know, you, you start out where Microsoft barely, I mean, doesn't have a browser in the very beginning. And Microsoft is the, the blue on this chart, of course. Uh, and it, you know, it starts out with no market share at all because it didn't build a web browser in the beginning. And then it moves to the point literally of a, a near monopoly in the browser market, which is why uh, the US government sues it for antitrust. Um, oops. And then uh, you see after a number of years that both that Firefox and other browsers start to break that monopoly. And actually that is, if you look at that 2005, 2006, that is the golden era uh, of the web. It's when Google and Facebook and all these companies, which may be a problem now, uh, emerge because you're able to um, build better things on the web because you've got a, a, a richer set of technology and a richer set of options and more competition in the browsers. So, you know, the, the story of that, and this is actually the, the Firefox One New York Times two-page ad launch. Uh, and this launch ad was, was crowdsourced. People paid $10, $10 $20, they donated because it was just a, a community project at the time, Firefox. They donated um, to put this ad in the New York Times and celebrate the launch. This is an example where using community, which is not the only way to change the rules, uh, but using the, the community changed the rules and actually built, um, built a, something totally different and took back the web from a, a, you know, one company that was dominating it. And of course, what you have now is a, a healthy ecosystem. Um, you know, we can get into the deep technology debates behind this and there are some things that are unhealthy um, from our perspective underneath the browser market today and the technology, but at the consumer level, you have real choice, not only between multiple browsers, but even multiple browsers that have a privacy focus. Um, and that is a real success of that system change um, that, that we look at in the story of, of the growth of the Firefox browser. So what would it look like just for a moment to change today's rules? 
you know, and is it is it all regulation or or is there something similar where we need to see community or companies or or both or individuals um, getting involved in in shifting the rules in a meaningful way? And, and I would argue yes. So if we go back to the game being the consumer technology that we have today or the B two B technologies, and haven't gone into that as much, but many of these points will will apply there as well. Um, and we think these are the, the players in the game and we can extend it to the Chinese players or other companies that are mid-sized that are coming up. And then we go back to this being the current rules. And we say, how might we shift these rules without saying we wanna you know, change the game altogether or get rid of these technologies? One thing is to change who's at the center of the diagram, to not assume that the computing paradigm the, the business logic is to put the company at the center and all of us on the edge, but to put ourselves in the center and to a certain degree, uh, you know, to, to give us control over the data and the AI, at least how it works, if, if not in a direct way. And then to put the companies at, at our behest, to look at us having rights and control over the data. And that, you know, in a conceptual way, that's what GDPR is. It says we have data rights. I mean, the, Europe is really the only other place. There's some, some specific countries. Kenya, interestingly enough, is one of them. Um, but there, there are very few places in the world have made that change. It says we have data rights. We have rights over algorithmic decision-making as individuals. Uh, and the companies are, should be at our service or in respect to, to our rights. So that is actually a piece of how we might change the game. But there's a question of, is that enough? Is it enough to give us individual data rights and, and to, to speak about individual data sovereignty? And is it enough to have regulation? Are we gonna create that shift that is similar to the shift between Internet Explorer and a rich competitive web technology and browser market? And so far the answer is no, we, we haven't seen it be enough. We actually see, uh, as the previous panel talked about, more concentration of power uh, in, the, in the big players who can just show up and lobby in Brussels and who can adapt to the changes uh, of the rules. And one of the things that, that I will argue and, and others like my colleague Martin Tisney at, at the, the Luminate Foundation in London uh, argues is that one of the missing things is we can't just be looking at individual data rights if we wanna shift the rules. We also need to look at what, what Martin has called collective data rights. And so if we go back to this, which is what let's say GDPR conceptually offers us, and we could just say, let's keep digging away at that. And I think there are ways that we can be better and better exploiting GDPR where companies, European companies could be using GDPR for competitive advantage, designing themselves to take advantage of that kind of expectation of, of user data sovereignty and growing and out competing. But I, I think there's more. And the, the more is looking at what would it be, what could we have be different if we had say collective data rights? And why collective data rights matter is one, if we're negotiating with these companies or we're, we're standing up for our rights under the law, doing that together is, is easier than doing that alone. Um, very few people themselves will go and kind of make a GDPR claim just on on behalf of themselves as an individual, that the stakes are, are too small in an individual case, even if they're large in a societal sense. Um, but you're starting to see people say, let's actually do that. Let's actually come together for our data rights, even if we don't have different data rights, and to some degree to, to organize. And one example, um, which you may not know by name, is the Worker Info, info Exchange. But you may know them because you've seen them in the press, and they're the group of Uber drivers and, and other gig economy drivers who recently won a UK Supreme Court case um, where the Supreme Court decided that as Uber drivers, they are workers and they have worker rights. But to do that, they had to collectivize their data. They had to gather data from a number of other Uber drivers to make their case. Getting their individual data under GDPR wasn't enough. They need to be able to see those patterns, which is actually the, the information between each of the drivers. Similarly, in the US, Consumer Reports, which is the kind of national consumers union uh, in, in the US, 
has started to look at using something under California's GDPR, the, the CCPA, where you can delegate the rights to represent your represent you to a third party to start to build a service where consumers can collectivize and then go negotiate terms of service um, with, with the companies or negotiate how their data is treated with companies. And then just a Mozilla example, we've started to work with a community of people who wanna create an alternative um, set of technology around voice assistance, around conversational AI, who are all coming and building an open source data set for how speech to text and text to speech works, not only in English or in Spanish or in German or in Mandarin, but in a lot of smaller languages that are not well served uh, by, by current technologies, bringing more people into the, the voice enabled web. So these are examples where you know, by getting together around their data, by thinking about power and data as something that's not just individual, but something that we need to look at collectively, people are starting to do some small things that are different. So small things that assume some different rules. And one of the things we've done recently at Mozilla, um, as I come to a close, is, is start to uh, we've launched something called the Data Futures Lab. And that's starting to look at the fact that there's a whole wave of people who are trying to change the rules in these different ways, talking about alternative data governance approaches that may lean on things like GDPR, but really are about the practice of building something differently around data. And they might call that you know, data trusts or data cooperatives or data commons or data collaboratives. A lot of the, the my data kind of people that Jana talked about earlier are, are in this broader community. And while the language is different, I see this as like the early wave that was there behind open source that eventually led to shifting the rules um, around the browser. And I think the people who this map represents, the thousands of people we documented in the hundreds we interviewed show that there is a wave towards doing something different and having different rules and how we build technology using data and AI. And so what, what might we think about as the same game with new rules? And the same game is the technologies that we, we want that bring us convenience, um, that connect us, that enable our businesses, but also looking at balancing not only the interests of the people who make those technologies, the companies who make those technologies in the rules that we play by, but also balancing those, the needs of, of us as in, individuals and, um, and society as a whole. Uh oh, my microphone may have just dropped out. So with that, hoping you can still hear me, uh, here is the, Mozilla Festival. Oh, I just want to make sure my microphone. Oh, it is still working. Um, here's the Mozilla Festival, um, and it's a, a group of, of people that we bring together every year, who are technologists, who are activists, who are and they build alternative futures, and. Really, it's, it's the kind of thing that we really um, use to find that common cause and, and change the rules. And so we're hoping that we can maybe work with Citra, work with many of you in the audience um, to look at what new rules we might build around a fair data economy, around collective data governance, whether that's expanding what's happening in law and in Brussels to go beyond individual data rights to collective data rights, there's things starting to happen around the, the Data Governance Act in that regard, or much more importantly, uh, working with, with people to build alternative data governance to change the rules in actual technology by building data cooperatives, data trusts, data commons um, into services that people are actually using every day. And I think with that, I'll say thank you and, and wrap up. That's more than my 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Sherman. And Toronto, sorry about that mistake. Um, okay. We might see again, I mean, Canada and Finland, because I think, I don't know if you are, Mark, a friend of ice hockey, but there are some interesting games coming up. And uh, we might, absolutely. after absolutely. Thursday's game, we might see on we Saturday. Might. There you go. We might see it. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for these uh, great presentations, for your inspi uh, inspirational words. And uh, we send you greetings from Helsinki to Toronto and hope to see you also in the future again with, uh, with us one day. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and as Andrea said, you know, follow up on Twitter, ask questions, and uh, we'll see you soon. That's a we'll great invitation. Person. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Have a good day.